Why did the data set go to therapy? <laughs> I don't know why did the data set go to therapy. Thank you very much. Because it was suffering from <laughs> it was suffering from bad relationships and missing values. <laughs> I couldn't have asked for a better lead-in. The, the, the passion that, that, you, that you had for the data it was, was fantastic. That, that was great to see. Uh, but the purpose of today will be to go through uh, a number of examples that I want to empower you with tools and techniques and processes that you're going to be able to use to have a more informed and better, more powerful discussion when it comes to data management of your company. First thing I want to do is jump right in into an example from a real-world experience. and definitely encourage uh, input from from you guys as well here the scenario is that we have an implementation a new system conversion one system to another one we have five billion dollar company hundreds of thousands of projects in, in the past we need to decide which information we're going to convert from the old system to the new system we have a number of people involved in this discussion operations and min folks business analysts and developers and the question is what are the characteristics of job data job is one of the main things we got to bring over. What are the characteristics that we're going to use to decide what jobs need to come over from the old system to the new? Open question. Dive right in if you guys want to participate. People jobs or software jobs? So, so I'll give you a little more, more background here. So we're a construction company. And we so we have projects all throughout, uh, let's say, all of Canada. And we, we have different sites all around. We have thousands of people working on site, equipment, jobs, all those types of projects. Okay? So of those jobs, we're a 20, 25-year-old company. We've got hundreds of thousands of historical jobs. And we have to decide what subset of that overall set of data are we going to bring into our new system, our new ERP system when we set it up. So what are the characteristics of that job data are we going to use to determine what information comes from the old system into the new? Currency. Currency. As in which, like, well, US dollar? How old it is or how, like, how long? Oh, currency. Is. How long? How long yeah. it is? How long has that job been around? Yeah. Did it start 20 years ago or 10 years ago or something? Right. You want to okay. import it all and you want to just cut it off at a certain point and how valuable is your historical data? Thank you. Anyone else? Retention requirements? Retention, such as? Regular regulatory requirements, right? So let's say that CRA needs you to have access in some form of seven years, let's say. Okay, regulatory requirements, anything else? Completeness. Completeness. What's actually needed? What's needed for? Plus, well, so like, instead of just straight migration, just like. Is this a chance to deprecate stuff that doesn't need to be converted anymore? Yep. Doesn't need to be converted. Needed for what purpose? Well, it's like oftentimes companies will have all these legacy things and they'll say, okay, I've got to convert all these jobs over just because they exist today. But do they need to be tested? Do they need to still, like, just ask the question, like, why? What, what actually needs to be converted in what? Okay. So do they need the historical data for analysis? And also, did they finish a project? Is there a reason they didn't finish it? Or also, if the customer is continuing to be a customer, or it was one time one off thing 10 years ago and we don't really care. So it really depends on what's important to the company uh, in how they analyze their metrics. Excellent. These are fantastic. Uh, so the leads right into to this guy here. So what the uh, of these, the there's uh, some, some examples that we have from system conversions. One of the things that we'll do is we'll go in and look for these, well, there'll be, there'll be somewhat failed implementations. One of the main reasons why that happens is because the decisions around the information to be brought over were incorrect, incomplete, unreliable, inconsistent, all those types of things. And so the, the optimal approach is to look at what the end users are going to need. What are their informational needs? The end users can be any stakeholders for that information. Regulatory authorities can be internal, external, uh, all, all those types of things. So you look at what they're going to use the information for and that's going to help to dictate what needs to be brought over. Um, the people that come to that to that discussion. So one of the one of the opportunities for improvement that I see is that you have business analysts will come to the table and they'll come uninformed. They'll say, "Tell me what you need. 
we'll, we'll write it down, we'll make a list, and then we'll, we'll pull all that data in. One of the problems with that is that you have an opportunity to investigate some of that information. So when you, when you as the analyst are going and asking the end users, tell me what you need. You, you, you can go into the system. You can see what reports people are running. You, you, you can have a somewhat informed conversation prior to that, to that meeting. Uh, the developers, one of the, one of the risks there is that the developers gather the requirements and say, all right, I did what I'm told, and there you go. And they don't really understand what the end use case is. They have a knowledge, an intimate understanding of the, of the SQL, of the database structure, and they understand that there are multiple potentially overlapping data sets, and they, they can see when which ones are used for which purpose. And so they can also lend insight in, and, and have, help to have a more informed discussion around what information needs to be brought over. So I'm going to give you one example of how, you know, one, one conversion that happened a, a while back was that they, they looked at historical information, they, they picked somewhat arbitrary cutoffs. They said, we're going to need X number of jobs, X number of departments, and these people, and our, these customers are no longer with us, and these, um, you know, X number of years we, we need. And they came up with in, independent or not taking in consideration the end user needs, they came up with the definitions of what need to be included. And that is a suboptimal approach to looking at what the end user informational needs are. And I'll give you one example, and that's something like this. So if your question is, what job information do we need to bring over from the old system into the new, you can look at some of the reports that are being used. And one is the WIP report, work in progress. I'm getting a little accounting and focused here, but that's, that's okay. Bear with me on it. So, so the WIP report, Work in Progress, shows you a list of all of the jobs that is being used in a specific function in the company. But in addition to that, your, what you as the end user have now given uh, more information and you've killed multiple birds with a one stone by answering the question, what jobs need to come in? You provide them with this report and you say the end result needs to be that I can create this WIP report in the new converted system. Okay, they didn't, the people that asked you the question, they didn't say, what other transactional information do you need? Because by now you, you provide it, you show projected costs, projected revenue, billings, over under billings, project fate, all that information has now been presented to the developers and the, and the analysts to say, this is, this is also information that you need to make sure is brought into the, into the system. So. The way I like to define data quality is the extent to which the quality of the inputs contributes to the quality of the output. The output is a business process, a solution, a report, some something. Okay, the end users are going to use, and that something is impacted by the quality of the inputs. The quality of the output is not just affected by the by the data. It could be the aesthetics, the ease of use, the configuration, the performance, all those types of things affect the quality of that output. However, the extent to which the, the, uh, the data is affected by the quality of the inputs um, is the data quality. So accuracy, completeness, consistency, timeliness, relevance, accessibility, reliability. Um, bit of an aside, I came from an auditing, accounting background. And these, these, this, this was one of the very interesting things to me when I moved a little bit away from the, the CPA type world into data management. Um, it was interesting to me to see the extent to which uh, audit assertions, I, I don't know if we have other accountants in here, but audit assertions and, and audit techniques are useful in, in assessing the quality of data. So applying those types of techniques, there's a lot of crossover there. Uh, and these, these are somewhat almost identical to some of, some of those assertions. <clears throat> okay, so next thing I wanna do is talk about a data quality dashboard. So um, one, of the, one of the approaches I've seen companies do when they all of a sudden get excited about data quality is they say, well, this is great, and they go do investigations, and they find these, these new tools and fancy applications, and they say, this is great, all we gotta do is buy the application, plug, play, install, and it's gonna be good. We're gonna have good data quality. So one of the problems with that is they don't go through a proper analysis on what to include and what to exclude when it comes to their data quality. So I'm going to open it up and anyone provide me with information on what you think would be suitable to include or exclude in your data quality analysis workbook dashboard. I got lots of great feedback last time. Yeah, Ben. Uh, outliers? Outliers. Okay. You want to take my they're just typo or misentry or uh, genuine 
Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. I argue that you should probably include those tests even before you look at the dashboard at the uh, part of the data platform, the perhaps data ingestion as a SQL test at the very least. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. How many missing data do we have? How many missing data we have? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Impact. Nice impact. I like it. Impact. One example. Yes, prioritization, risk analysis, all the kind of stuff. That's great. Okay, so um, I'm going to come back to this in a second. Some of the things that have that should happen prior to, I think, to, to your point back there, prior to just having a fancy dashboard that's going to, you know, have all the bells and whistles of gauges and colors, and it's going to look really fancy. What you want to do is look at other tools that you have available to you to then uh, fix those things even before you show them visually. Input restrictions, validations, required fields. So for example, uh, there is, you have the opportunity in your system to specify that this field is required or needs to be valid, a date field. Why would you have something other than a date in a, in a date field? Somewhat similar to your, your note there about March 1st. Um, so, so look through all of, all of those opportunities. Now, it's not always quite so straightforward. I'll give you an example. You set up a new, again, to borrow from the construction uh, industry, but you set up a new job, and every job is supposed to have an owner, someone responsible for it, a project manager. When you set up the job, you don't know who the project manager is. So can you make that a required field? Not really. Right, because then you'd restrict people from being able to set up jobs properly. So you'd set it up, you then have a, you'd have that piece on your dashboard. It wouldn't be required, but it would be shown as a, uh, as an exception, as a missing, as missing data. Other things, notifications. Notifications are great for high risk items that can't be, that cannot be subject to input restrictions and validations. I'll give you an example there. One is uh, we had a, a situation a while back where someone was what had access to vendor information. They received an email from that vendor and said, change our EFT information to this. And, and he did it. He changed the information to the EFT, to the information on the email, then proceeded to pay that vendor. I think we are all know what, what's gonna happen next. Mm -hmm. That was not a proper email. It didn't go through the right channels. It didn't go through proper validations. Yes, they should have had those those controls and protocols in place to ensure that those things happened. However, you can also have th th those things can slip through the cracks, and so you can have notifiers to help with these types of data quality issues by showing when high risk issues processes can happen. Then what do you do? You have a notifier that says this field vendor EFT information has changed. I want someone to know about that pretty quickly. Once that's done, then that's where the dashboarding can be helpful. And what uh, what we tend to do is, is what we call exception reporting. So I don't want to show a dashboard that shows all of my missing customer physical mailing addresses when I'm not going to be mailing my customers anything. I'm sending them emails and invoices through email. I'm not going to do a physical mail campaign. So I don't really want to see a gauge that shows me that 20% of my customers are missing mailing info when I'm never going to use it. So what we do is we look at exception reporting and you have a list of member of our team built this and he's in the audience and it's, it's very good. Um, but uh, this, I don't know if you can see that very well, but what this is, is um, things that could be right or could be wrong but you don't know, and you gotta check it out. So when, when you click on each one of these, these pieces, and we're, we're using Excel for this, Excel can be a great tool if used, used correctly. <laughs> uh, you click on each one of these, and you then have a list of all of the data that could be right, could be wrong, okay? Is it 100% is it the case that if someone works more than eight hours in a day, that all of that time should be overtime? Is that the case? Any payroll people in here? It is not the case. You have day rates. You have other situations where people will work 12 hours. You have firemen, for example. They work 12 hours, then they don't get paid overtime after that, right? So, but you then they're lumped in together with a whole bunch of other people, and so you can't simply say any time that is over eight hours is a problem. Show it to me. And let's fix it. It's exception reporting. You have to you have to group those people together and analyze it into, uh, independently. And so these are examples of where you have information shown in the system where it's grouped together in a way that you can then analyze it and assess whether or not it's done properly. 
So in conclusion, data scope is defined by the end user needs. You want to avoid as much as possible coming up with arbitrary definitions of what you feel is relevant data to be brought over from the old system to the new one. And this is, this is not just a principle for system conversions, but for any sort of business process solution report that involves an aspect of data quality. The scope is related to the to the use of that information. Data quality, the extent to which the quality of the inputs contributes to the quality of the outputs. And data quality controls. So those are the ones we talked about with input validations, restrictions, notifications. And once that's all been done, then you can have exception reporting where you, you review the information and you make the, the human judgment call. We're still useful humans, you know, we still have a it's still a place for us. We review those things to see whether or not that information needs to be uh, needs to be adjusted on a case by case basis. And uh, that's about it. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. So within your work, how are there any particular data standards like related to previous speakers' talk that you would use or? Any, uh, Any data standards yeah. that we would use? Okay, so um, it, it was interesting. Um, really liked the presentation again. Uh, one of the one of the things that I thought of with the invoice date, for example, is that yes, you get lots of different definitions of of, of invoice date. Uh, my, it's uh, and you don't always have the ability, uh, the opportunity to to dictate what those definitions might be. But there are uh, data standard. Group setting, group set, uh, data setting, data standard setting groups out there. Uh, and for example, invoice dates, you'd have uh, GAP, right? <coughs> I for S and GAP. And so they would say something like the, uh, the the date at which the rights and responsibilities and obligations of the asset transfers from them to you is the date at which that needs to be identified as an asset or liability on your books. And if the invoice date represents that, then you can use that as that as that definition. And so I would look at it, but you don't, we're not always subject to gap. Taxes, for example, that's not necessarily gap, and they might have different rules. And so looking for those official regulatory standard setting bodies out there and adopting those if if possible and if relevant, and then declaring that you're you're subject to those those regulations or those standards, I think is, uh, is, a, is a good opportunity and something to look for. Yes. Uh, in my practice, I have another situation often when data are not dirty, but when data are falsified. And we need uh, <coughs> any instruments, any algorithms for identification of the falsification data. I think I'll need to hear the question one more time. There's, a, there's an issue with data being falsified fraudulently versus by mistake? Yes. Okay. We need to separate mistaken data and data misspecification. Data misspecification. So, like, uh, so so intentionally uh, mis uh, intentionally um, incorrect information versus uh, by mistake. Is that right? Yeah, so borrowing again from my, my audit background, right? So the, the purpose of an audit is to identify mistakes, whether due to fraud or error. So they don't care. Auditors they don't care so much. Forensic auditors, they will, right? Uh, but that's when you look for the mistakes, first of all. And then within those, what you do is if, if there is a reason to believe that the, that the specific type of error relates to fraudulent activities, then further... Uh, that then further investigation is required. So I would say that the, the highest level is independent of the expected intent of the or, or the how that error came about, and then further procedures would be involved if there's there's a suspicion of, of fraudulent activity. And I think probably the way to do that is there's different areas that are more susceptible to fraud. Cash, right? AR cash, accounts payable. Uh, your equipment depreciation list, probably not very you know, a, a fun one for fraud, right? But you look for certain areas that are going to be more likely to have that, and then you perform additional procedures if you feel that, that is a, that's a risk area. Yes? There's actually some really interesting research being done right now uh, where data science is able to detect fraud in number, reports of numbers, scientific research, financial reports, etc., based on the incidence of certain digits. So mm -hmm. fraud increasingly can be detected 
Um, by data scientists, so who are you? I feel the practice with environmental monitoring data is that for post-Soviet countries is a common problem when uh, in, in Western science it named uh, dry land, when uh, chemical laboratories uh, falsified the data of investigations. Okay. Yeah, fair point. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the law, but it's some statistical law. Uh, where there's a prevalence, uh, a statistical distribution of what the last digit of a certain numbers set of numbers are going to be, and if that is out, then you can use that to to identify areas that might be suspicious. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, anyone else? Yes. As odd as this might come, come using your March first date, to European versus North American, you know, what's your source? What's your what's your output? How often, and I assume it's quite regularly, going to be an issue of, of your data quality. What's the date? Is it a month, a year? Is it a day, day month, year? <laughs> yeah, uh, we work in, in Canada, US as well, and, and there's different standards there. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that one comes up, especially with cross-border uh, interactions. Uh, transactions. I think one of the, the one of the easy ways, easier ways to do it is is uh, depending on the on the situation, um, is to look through the, your whole data set. So say you're dealing with multiple companies across multiple countries, and you can take the take the full list of all the data. And once you have more than ten or twenty of them, then you get a sense as to what the uh, how that one's configured. Um, on a case by case, invoice by invoice basis, it's not always so easy. Yes. Um, imagine a situation in which. You or I run a bank, or together we run a bank, and we have a nicely modeled data, you know, table for customers, or table for transactions, table for something else, right? Um, so, what would be um, the tools that you're aware of, or you could recommend that would allow basically data quality uh, monitoring over time, as well as quantifying that data quality that is basically scalable? Because I'm not going to have uh, myself look through all of those customers and transactions every single day. So how do you set? So we we own a bank, whole bunch of data going through it, and we want to run. We want to create some algorithms that are going to automatically identify potentially fraudulent transactions. No. No. Okay. We have a uh, transaction database where all that is synced in real time. Okay. Every day we run a uh, data warehouse building where we. Uh, Aggregate all the data, right? Nicely model it, gimbal style. I want to make sure that the quality of that warehouse that will then be used for analytics actually does not deteriorate over time. And we'll see, like, basically, is uh, my warehouse in good shape or not? Did I let some crappy data in? Uh, that, that's that's great. Um, I thought data warehouses just work perfectly all the time. It's just no. Uh, yeah, that was that was another area I was I was thinking about focusing on on, on this, but you know, limited time. Uh, th there's how so the the initial architecture and construction of the data warehouse that'd be the first thing to look at is whether or not those relationships are are are, are valid. Like the, there's situations where people build uh, the data warehouse not allowing or accommodating uh, existing relationships, and so is it is it robust enough? So lots of ways to test that out. But then you have changing relationships and changing information and additional granularity that happens in one system that then has to be mirrored in, in, in the next system. Uh, and the, the there's a number of techniques to do it. I think the uh, one of the most robust, though, is to continue to have uh, tying out to, uh, to, to as much um, corroborating data as, as you can in, in different systems. So you have a list of, of reports um, that are going to, that are going to build, that they're, um, uh, let's see. <laughs> I think that there's no perfect system, uh, but it's, it's a combination of looking at the quality of the outlying data, the, the reports, ensuring that those all tie out, as well as looking at the inputs. One of the risks is that you look at one or the other, because if all you do is you look at the, the transactions, the SQL joins, and things that you've built, you're not, and that's often the developer approach, is I'm just going to look at the quality of that data, I'm going to do my, my, uh, you know, my, my quality review and analysis on it, and you just look at the um, the, the logic that you've incorporated into this into the code, and that's important. But you want to validate and balance that with the the uh, with with reports that then tie things out um, comprehensively throughout all the data points in the system. Yes. Uh, can you just like walk us through an example where you've seen data quality managed somewhere, like 
you know, everything went really well, as well as it could be. And then, who are the different stakeholders and what was their role in, in getting to that success point? Oh, let you expand on that. Uh, yeah, so that was one more question that I have. Uh, yeah, could you talk about maybe um, client impact? Like, how does data quality kind of improve the business overall? Just extension of that question. Okay, uh, yeah, a couple examples. Um, some some of these the system conversion one is just a just a massive potential failure point, and that is where uh, the companies are told that this is how this is the information you need to bring over. They bring that over, and then they find the end users find that they can't use the data, and we have then what we call a rescue implementation, where we go in x number of months after the fact, and the the end users can't. At the, in worst case, they can't even process their basic, you know, payroll or accounts payable or something. They can't do it because the data didn't come in. It came in corrupted. And so we have to then make an assessment as to whether or not it makes more sense to go and redo the implementation or if we can we can fix those issues, identify them all, and then fix them all and just make a make a whole system correction. Uh, so, so a system conversion is one really good example, high risk area where uh, we, we, we get asked to go and, and identify those issues and then decide which, which approach to, to use to fix it. Another example, though, is, is buying new applications. So people see this, this new fancy, flashy application. They, they, you know, they go through these uh, discussions with people around data quality and fixing their data. You know, once, you get, once you get that done, then you'll be able to have these fancy reports. But then they, they might just go to the right to that one of these, you know, uh, like a like a corporate performance management system company and say all we need to do is 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 uh, buy that system, and so I think one example that comes to mind is when uh, when a company is told and promised that they they can report on something like their 12 month projected cash flow, and they can do that by joining these two systems together and this one application provider can just magically do that for them. So we take all your data, throw it in the big data lake house warehouse whatever else. And we'll just report on all that. And I think that the, the one of the takeaways I, I hope that you guys get from this is that you guys are probably already aware of this, but but if not, you want to make sure that you understand how they expect to do that. Have they have they figured out how the data in one in those systems tie together so that you can assess the reliability of the connections and the, and the reporting approach that they're that they're proposing? Um, so a specific example, if you like. Time, yeah, I'm up. Just a small announcement. Yeah, shoot. For those who want to attend the, uh, the panel, just go to go upstairs to the auditorium, and uh, we'll start after a break at 11 from the talks uh, from the auditorium. Those two talks are going to be here at 11. Yeah, and we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions and discussions. Yeah, thank you. Okay. But John's talk is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>